John Alterman. I'm a senior vice president here, the Brzezinski Chair in Global Security and Geostrategy and the director of the Middle East program. And to consider the problem, the problems that we'll all face after Mosul, we have um, two really spectacular uh, speakers. Um, to your right, my left, is Dr. David Kilcullen. Dave is a leading expert on counterinsurgency and modern warfare. Uh, he advises everybody I know, and everybody I know listens. Uh, he founded re the research and analysis firm Keras Associates in 2010. Prior to that, he was the chief strategist in the Department of State's Counterterrorism Bureau. He's a senior counterinsurgency advisor to General David Petraeus in Iraq, was his special advisor for counterinsurgency for, the, for then Secretary of State Condoleezza Rice. He served for 25 years as a light infantry officer in the Australian Army. He got his PhD at the Australian Defense Force Academy at the University of New South Wales. He is the best-selling author of four books, most recently Blood Year, and he is in the Future of War program at the New America Foundation. Uh, speaking with him, and I think complimenting him beautifully, uh, is Jessica Lewis McFate. She's the Director of Tradecraft and Innovation at the Institute for the Study of War. Uh, for three years, from 2012 to 2015, she was the director of research at the Institute for the Study of War, where she sort of laid the groundwork for what I think everybody acknowledges is the remarkable role that the Institute for the Study of War plays in people trying to understand what's happening, uh, especially in Iraq, Syria, and Afghanistan. Uh, she joined the Institute for the Study of War after serving for eight years on active duty as an intelligence officer in the U.S. Army. She spent uh, almost three years deployed to Iraq and Afghanistan, where she provided intelligence support to tactical, operational, and theater commands. She's twice been awarded the Bronze Star for her impact on operations. She's written a lot, including as recently as yesterday, uh, on Iraq and Syria, strategies to defeat the Islamic State. Um, she got her Bachelor of Science from West Point and a Master's in Strategic Intelligence from the American Military University. In addition to these spectacular speakers, we also are relying in part on you guys. There are clickers on, that are on the chairs. Um, the way the clickers will work is we will ask you questions, which are basically policy judgment questions about priorities and options and those kinds of things uh, throughout the presentation. And what you have to do is first turn it on because the clickers turn themselves off after a minute. And then we'll ask the question, you'll choose A, B, or C, and we'll put the results up here, and we'll use that as a, uh, a jumping off point for our discussion. So, I think the first thing to talk about after is to talk about the And to do that, what I'd like to do is just have Jessica just talk a little bit about where the battle is. And then Dave, who is, I mean, Dave has thought more about counterinsurgency both presently and then the history of counterinsurgency, working on Indonesia and other things for ac academic work, can sort of talk about what this all means if you're interested in the problem of fighting counterinsurgency or fighting insurgencies. So Jessica, why don't you just give us a, a snapshot of where the battle for Mosul is right now? Certainly. Let me just thank you for that lovely introduction and I'm so thrilled to be a part of this event today. Mosul is Iraq's second largest city. That makes it a very complex urban objective from a military view. Uh, we have cleared Mosul before, so I would say overall we still have, as a coalition, the operational advantage, and I do believe that Mosul will be sufficiently cleared uh, for government operations and reconstruction operations to begin, with several important caveats that I hope that we will discuss in this panel. Operationally, the Iraqi security forces, Kurdish forces, the coalition that has been built in order to fight for Mosul um, has currently taken over a number of neighborhoods on the eastern side of Mosul, the north, east, and the southeast. The, uh, the efforts that have pushed from the south are currently stalled. Uh, there are more efforts from the north that have not yet progressed into the city. And there are a number of efforts to the west of Mosul around the city of Talafer that are currently also underway. Uh, the most recent advance along that western axis has been the transfer of responsibility from Iraqi Shia militias, the PMU, the popular mobilization units that were uh, asserting uh, for the operation of Tawafer to uh, a unit from the Iraqi army that is currently now responsible. Um, 
PMU uh, efforts are also now pushing west of Tolafra towards Sinjar and down towards a village in the Jazeera Desert called Baj. So there are still area clearing operations around Mosul that are taking place to set further conditions on constraining and limiting ISIS's ability to adapt as the operation for the city is still ongoing. Now ISIS's strongholds in Mosul are on the western side of the river, which have not been uh, retaken yet. Uh, I would highlight that northwestern uh, Mosul is the area that was hardest to clear in the 2008 timeframe. So the hardest parts of the Battle of Mosul are still uh, before the coalition, um, as are the government buildings that are on the west side of the river, as is the base. There are bridges along the way. So clearly the battle is not yet won. There are many things that have to occur, but I would still submit that I'm optimistic that the operational advantage is to the coalition. Um, there are some elements that we were discussing prior to the panel that I would highlight as particular impediments, though. Uh, one of the large questions has been what to do with the civilian population in Mosul. On the one hand, uh, it would be easier for clearing forces if the village, it was if, the, if the city only had uh, enemy forces in it. Uh, Prime Minister Abadi, however, had asked for uh, the civilians in Mosul to remain because it's an incredible humanitarian concern how to support uh, displaced persons in numbers as large as the civilian population remaining in Mosul. Counterterrorism services have asked him uh, to repeal uh, that request because tactically it's very difficult. Uh, more options are limited to support combat operations if you're operating in an urban environment, which is of course a lesson that the uh, US military is very familiar with. So uh, the Mosul operation is still ongoing. It's con gains are constrained to the eastern side of the river. Uh, there are many efforts that are still underway. Um, I'm still optimistic, but we have a long way to go. And just to clarify, when you talk about the coalition, there, we, we're used, I think, in American terms of talking about the coalition being the 66 countries fighting with the United States. But the coalition, which you're talking about, is this rather remarkable Iraqi coalition, which has proved more durable than the skeptics thought, which brings together a number of elements which have to be kept together as we go through operations in Mosul. You have Kurdish Peshmerga forces fighting alongside Iraqi army units to fight for Mosul, a control of which is desired by everybody. So it is remarkable that the coalition is holding together the tactical coalition um, with as many in interest divergences as one could fathem. Um, they're still holding together to retake the city from ISIS. And the popular mobilization units, some of which are supported by Iran, many of which are overwhelmingly Shia, to control a city that is about 70% Sunni, Sunni Arab, and then also about 20% Kurdish, right, well, 25%. Combined so, with some tribal forces. Um, so it's, it's, there, there are a lot of coalitions that have to be kept moving ahead. Dave, this is hard, but you've done all kinds of hard stuff. You've seen people do hard stuff. Where does this all fit? Well, let me put it in perspective, right? This is the largest urban battle, not only in Iraq, but anywhere on the planet in this century so far. So it's huge. I mean, we're talking about somewhere between 1.2 and 1.5 million civilians in and around the city. Um, maybe somewhere between six to 9,000 ISIS fighters, you think, yeah? Yes, and 60,000 60, plus in the coalition that Jessica was just describing. Um, to put that in perspective, the Battle of Fallujah in 2004 is about one-tenth, one-eighth to one-tenth the size. Mm -hmm. The battle that's going on in Aleppo right now is about one-third the size of what we're, talk we're dealing with here. So it's a huge challenge. And I'm not going to fight Jessica on the question of whether we're going to win or not. I agree we are, but I, I think... Um, uh, it's not done yet, right? And um, it, the, the hard bit, I agree, is still to come. The airfield, particularly the northern end of the airfield, and northwestern uh, Mosul, both of which are on the other side of a river, a number of the bridges of which have been knocked out and the others are prepped for demolition, um, is still to come. So there's a significant amount of fighting still to go. Um, in a conventional military urban warfare doctrine sense, we tend to break the stages of an urban battle down into various phases. First one's isolation, so isolating the objective. That happened between August and October and was pretty, frankly, quite effective. Um, there was a deliberate effort to leave uh, a sector to the west to allow ISIS to withdraw uh, if they wanted to so that we could kill them in the open more easily away from civilians. That didn't happen. Um, 
but the isolation is completed. The next phase is break-in battle. That's where we are now. So we've successfully broken into the eastern part of the city. We are still about to break into the north. And as Jessica said, the, the south is, let's, let's say, sl pro proceeding slowly. I don't think it's actually stalled, but it's, it's close to stalled. Um, the next thing that would happen would be, once you've completed the break-in, you then have to exploit your objectives. You've got to secure those objectives, places like the airfield and so on, uh, the government centre as well. And then you've got to clear the city of remaining um, hostile combatants. And then you're into the whole transitional process. It's when you're in the clearance and transition phase that things like counterinsurgency start to become more important rather than just straight up conventional military fighting. And I think the last point you guys made is really relevant here because counterinsurgency is a system for projecting the control of an effective government to stabilise uh, a population or, or a piece of urban terrain. Who is the government going to be after we seize uh, Mosul? If you don't have a clear idea of that, um, not at the macro level, but at the street level, who's, who runs which mahala, who runs which part of the city, that's when uh, uh, there's a lot of opportunities for an insurgent to bounce back. ISIS to date have shown a huge degree of resiliency in the face of these kinds of operations. They don't tend to die in place and uh, you know, um, disappear. They tend to remain mobile, to manoeuvre, to run what we call an active network defence. And that will translate into a commuter insurgency after we seize Mosul. So we'll have still mobile, active ISIS units trying to stay mobile, trying to move around the battlefield, conducting counterattacks, car bombs, um, maybe raids on headquarters, uh, attacking logistics installations, those kinds of things, trying to make the city ungovernable, effectively. And then we're also likely to see significant pushback elsewhere in Iraq. Every time we've captured a city back from ISIS, there's been what you might call centrifugal attacks in other parts of the country, trying to make it hard for us to concentrate our forces uh, in the area that we've just captured and consolidate. So I think we can expect all of that from ISIS. Um, where they have a significant weakness is I think that they don't have uh, much popular support from the community in Mosul or from the surrounding uh, areas. And of course, for an insurgent, that's really a fundamental element of the operation. If you don't have that, it becomes much harder to sustain an insurgency over time. Um, so I think I would point to the governance piece. I would point to the uh, how do you handle the commuter insurgency and how do you uh, deal with that. But fundamentally, it's who's in charge and do the population accept the legitimacy of the governing authority in their area. If you've got that, then everything else becomes possible in a counterinsurgency environment. If you don't, you're still effectively in the, in the war of maneuver phase. So, so strategically, from a US perspective, I think one of the policy questions to ask is, is how far along the spectrum does the US government need to go? So what I'd like you all to do is take out your clickers and hit the on button. And we'll go to the first question, which is, what should the top US priority in Mosul be? So if you think the, the number one priority should be to destroy organized groups of ISIS fighters, that is these six to 9,000 guys, to, to destroy the organization, that's A. If the idea is to genuinely purge the city of, of uh, ISIS fighters and supporters, that is not just the organized groups, but all the sort of latent things, that's B. To reestablish the Iraqi government's, the central Iraqi government's control, that's C. And to D to create, and D is to create stability both in the city and in the surrounding countryside. So to really get rid of the Islamic State group broadly. So it goes from sort of narrow, sort of conventional combat piece, getting broader and broader until we get to, to really stability in the countryside. So if you could all click. And what I'm seeing is about 60 of you voted. So some people are being slackers. If you're being a slacker, please vote. And what, what we're seeing is really a remarkable amount of support for a more comprehensive American effort. 
that is what in this room a lot of support mm -hmm. for not leaving too soon, for being committed through this and, and, and really creating a broader sense of stability. Uh, this is perhaps a reflection of a, a Washington audience uh, that is, is more global in its orientation, but I think it's interesting that there's quite that much support um, for, for the, the two really more strategic uh, levels of intervention. Um, what is your sense, and Jessica, this is, I think, really a question for you. As the U.S. has been in this advise and assist mm -hmm. role, how well is that working? Is it working the way we want it to? Is it working the way we need it to? After many years fighting mm -hmm. Iraq, assisting, have we gotten it right? Can we sustain this kind of long-term intervention the way people want us to? Not if we treat Mosul as the finish line. Um, I think that the, uh, the advise and assist, the partner building capacity efforts that have preceded the operation have succeeded in literally reconstituting divisions. The divisions that we reconstituted from scratch are perhaps the ones that are most stalled. Uh, so I think that is a, a metric we need to take into consideration that when we want to uh, estimate the full capacity of the Iraqi security forces to sustain the security of Iraq post Mosul, um, I would say there are still many challenges ahead. One of which is exactly how the integration of the popular mobilization units is going to transpire. Uh, those forces do raise lots of concerns. While they are not exclusively uh, Shia militias, they are largely so. Um, and a number of the militias, some of which are Iranian-backed, um, are uh, accused of uh, rather grievous uh, sectarian violence as the hold forces in cities such as Tikrit that have been retaken from ISIS. So as we imagine what would be left if we won Mosul tomorrow and we went back home, I would say that the, uh, the efforts are not, the efforts that have ha taken place already to build this Iraq security forces are not durable, uh, which is also a lesson I think we've learned over the course of the last few years. Uh, so the, uh, the question is what level of presence and engagements do we need to sustain in order to uh, continue to set conditions for stability? If we take that question even simply at the level of Mosul, uh, what does the government of Mosul, of Nineveh, require in order to maintain security? We're talking about reestablishing police in Mosul, uh, which leads me quickly to another point that I want to highlight, and we can discuss it um, at will on the panel or in question and answer. Uh, what is going to happen with the displaced Sunni population uh, in Nineveh, just as an example of a question? Uh, I agree very much that ISIS is not thoroughly popular with that population, uh, but that population is no more likely to cleave to Baghdad than it was prior to ISIS's seizure of Mosul. Uh, there are uh, fundamental concerns, rejectionist movements, competing Salafi jihadi movements, overall risk of a sectarian civil war, um, a Sunni insurgency, perennial issues that we've seen in Iraq over time that are peaking right now. And I think we would do best to regard that Iraq is going to face several uh, major inflections along those consistent themes over the course of the next year. Mm -hmm. So the Iraqi security forces need to be prepared to do several things, is my point. Not just to keep ISIS out once ISIS has been pushed out of Mosul and other cities throughout the country, uh, but also to set conditions that uh, prevent a Sunni insurgency or a sectarian civil war or an ethnic one. And I think that the reason why, and again, the microcosm context of Mosul, the uh, tactical coalition among many interested parties is working is because we are engaged in it. We are leading it. I think if we were to withdraw, uh, those conditions would not endure. But, but also partly because this is fundamentally a military operation, we bring something to the table. And, and what Dave you know, spent years trying to work is how do you persuade them on the more political sides of counterinsurgency? Mm. Yeah, I mean, I, 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 would, I would agree with Jessica. I, th I think um, I would just put a slight nuance on it, which is that I like to think of it in terms of leverage, right? Mm -hmm. How do we maintain our leverage over their behavior? 
And one way, and I think the best way and a very good way, is to remain there, right? I mean, there's really no substitute for actually being there. Um, but there are also other factors, money, uh, certain kinds of enablers, intelligence, um, you know, just that, that can be used. And frankly, I think the most important battle or the most important fight for the Battle of Mosul has already been won, which was the effort over the summer by American leaders to actually forge the coalition that's fighting the battle right now. And half of guerrilla warfare is actually guerrilla diplomacy, getting different groups to co cooperate and, and pointing in the same direction for at least one or two battles. You know, and we've, we've achieved that, but it's how do you then sustain that over time? And conceptually, once ba Mosul is captured, the counterinsurgency problem is actually the Iraqi government's problem. Our problem is what we would describe as security force assistance or maybe foreign internal defence, which is a subtly but significant different, significantly different endeavour where we are not carrying the main combat burden. We are enabling a partner to do that. And if you look at how Mosul fell last time, it was a combination of locals who were Sunni, who knew the environment, who had legitimacy with the community, being excluded by officials in Baghdad. There was a sectarian element of Sunni versus Shia. There was an ethnic element of Arabs versus Kurds. And that led to a structure which looked solid on the surface, but was actually very hollow. And ISIS was able to exploit that by shaping the Iraqi military through a series of terrorist attacks and sort of convincing them that they needed to adopt a static defensive laydown across the city and occupy lots of checkpoints and so on. And what they did was it just radically pissed everybody off that lived in Mosul. There were people in 2013, 2014 talking about how it lived, felt like living inside a giant military camp just to try and move around the city. But at the same time, it meant that the Iraqis were stuck. So when 800 ISIS dudes turned up with tanks on the side of the city to attack in June 2014, they were fixed. They couldn't maneuver. They were already, um, you know, they were stuck in this kind of defensive layout. And I think we can expect a similar approach from ISIS again, but I think this time around, this is going to be our third time now with, with Mosul, uh, we owe it to ourselves to do a better job on you know, establishing that leverage and the kinds of enablers that are now allow us to prevent that kind of hollowness from happening. Well, what, what Jess was talking about was the, the, the importance of the political piece, the, the incorporating local leadership, the, the sort of opportunities uh, for Sunnis to control Sunni destiny, it is, right. a, a, I mean, it's a majority Sunni province and majority Sunni city. Uh, and Sunnis have felt systematically uh, ignored right. by the government of Iraq. How does the U.S. use its military contribution to maximize its leverage on political issues? Because uh, militarily, I think it's obvious where we have leverage. Politically, how do you tell... Iraqis that we understand their interests better than they think they understand their interests, or they better than they understand the best way to pursue their own political future. Mm. Well, I think there is an honest broker element to U.S. Um, relationship with the Iraqis, in the sense that everyone hates us roughly equally, right? And you know, every conversation that I had when I worked in Baghdad <coughs> began with five minutes of apologizing for the invasion, right? But then after that, the Iraqis were like, OK, but now I'm having this other problem. And it was almost like they just had to get it off their chest, and then we'd have the discussion. And I think um, the effort that's gone on over the summer shows that we still have a lot of credibility with fighters across the, across the board, even, frankly, with people in the, some people within the popular mobilization units, um, some of which are, are um, Iranian-backed. But there are others that are tribal. There's a Sunni component as well, it's small. Um, and I think being, remaining engaged in that part of it is really important. When we walked away from the awakening at the end of the surge, the Sahawa in, in Iraq, that's when they got attacked from both directions, from the government in Baghdad that was trying to exclude them from security of Sunni communities and from this resurgent ISIS organisation that went out heavily to basically punish and kill everybody that had been involved in the leadership of the Sahawa in sort of 2011, 2012. So again, hollowing out the possible opposition to, the, to their renewed insurgency when the time came around. Um, and I think we need, to, we need to focus on that. And again, money and the, the questions of things like um, intelligence flows, uh, some kinds of reconstruction assistance that we do better than they do. Uh, and I think that everybody recognizes that we do better. Yeah. 
So one of the honest broker issues, we're not the only brokers and we're not the only people with interest in Iraq. One of the issues is Turkey, which has profound interests in northern Iraq. Can we go to the Turkey question, Haley? And I think one of the questions we have to figure out is, is Turkey something, is Turkey's role in northern Iraq something we should encourage or constrain? So if you could take your clickers out again and turn them on because they've automatically turned off, what should Turkey's role in northern Iraq be? The first is, look, they're a NATO ally that has a need and a right to play a security role. We shouldn't be concerned about limiting the Turkish role. The second is that we need to focus principally on ISIS, and we should take help from anywhere we can get to defeat ISIS, and we'll work out the other stuff later. And the third is to say Turkey has its own set of interests. They're different from ours. Uh, Turkey's role needs to be sharply limited. So if you could vote. The person who said D is right. There were how many people? Three people. Two people said D. Hmm. Right, we should both limit it and encourage it. That's confusing. <laughs> So it's interesting. I mean, a much, much more even split. Um, about a third argue that, that Turkey's a NATO ally we should support. Uh, just over a third say, but we have different interests. And this is not an unusual problem, but I think a problem we're, we're facing in, in both Iraq and Syria that I'm sure you've thought a lot about. How do we think about other countries, and there are countries in the Gulf too. We have some interests that we share, but there are certainly interests we don't. How do we, how do we work that into both the military operations and thinking about the diplomacy surrounding this? Well, it's a wonderful question, and I'm honestly very uh, intrigued by your responses as well. Uh, my intuition goes to the current situation and how sensitive uh, regional dynamics are to adjustments in it. When Iran or Russia or Turkey takes a seemingly very small action in Aleppo or the area north of Aleppo, it causes huge gyrations uh, for regional and global dynamics. Uh, Turkey and Iran are in many respects uh, locked in a very small moving uh, micro-engagements across northern Syria. I think if the door were to open to the same level of micro-engagements in northern Iraq, the situation that we have right now with Turkey vis-a-vis -vis U.S. relations, which is already quite volatile, would become even more so. So I think I personally am therefore not in favor of increasing Turkish engagement in northern Iraq uh, because of the volatility. You know, treated in the abstract, uh, I also think that uh, Iran's engagement uh, in the operation for Mosul uh, has the same uh, potential to uh, spark the same uh, volatile circumstance, so I'm equally concerned by it. Uh, but I think, therefore, my answer would be that uh, I think that uh, the uh, best thing for the U.S. right now is to uh, Well, I'm, I'm going to throw they're a new variable in. They're all on the edge of their seats. Okay. Um, okay. I'm actually going to, uh, to insert uh, an answer as it applies to the Syrian theater and explore how it applies to Iraq. Uh, my biggest problem with our relationship with Turkey is that we have ignored the fact that they are supporting al-Qaeda in Syria. And we're just not dealing with that problem. I think it's a huge problem for U.S. interests in the region. Al-Qaeda is going to reinsert itself, has begun to reinsert itself into the vacuum of control of ISIS in Iraq. Uh, and we need to face that issue with Turkey and allow it to drive um, our answer to the question of how much uh, we celebrate their engagement. Because right now, the engagement in northern Syria is not entirely in line with our interests, and that would carry over to Iraq. So I would say we need to uh, establish um, a, a different norm with Turkey on that basis. Do you agree on the Turkish question? Um, I'm going to speak in favor of Turkey, just to make sure we have the alternative. Definitely. 
perspective here. I, I want to start by saying I totally agree with Jessica about Al Qaeda in Syria. Jabhat Fatah al Sham, formerly Jabhat al Nusra, in my mind is by far the most sophisticated and dangerous terrorist group that we've seen ever. Um, they combine the political sophistication of a group like Hezbollah with social programs, governance programs, and all the military capability, in fact, possibly more than what we've seen from ISIS. So they've got the potential, and they have an external operations um, mm -hmm. program. So I think they've got a very capable, significant uh, cap uh, element here, which in the event that ISIS does get destroyed in Syria, is going to immediately step into that gap. And so this and is the group formerly known as, as uh, Jabhat al Nusra. Jabhat Nusra. Yeah. Has become um, Jabhat which, of course, is led by the former uh, Al Qaeda in Iraq leader from Nineveh, who, who knows Mosul well and, and worked there for most of the time that we were there in Iraq, um, Mohammed al, al Jalani. So, uh, but he's much more sophisticated politically than many of the other folks that we've dealt with. So th that, that is a huge issue. But I, I would just say that. Um, Turkey, immediately after 2011, began demanding that the West and others engaged in trying to end the war in Syria. And it suffered massive inflows of refugees, uh, massive challenges to its own internal security through the emergence of an autonomous Kurdish uh, region directly across its border. It, 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 has, it, it started by asking the West for, for assistance, and it's a NATO ally. Uh, we did nothing. We didn't provide anything more than relatively feckless assistance uh, against the, um, the Assad regime. At this point in the war, Assad's regime has killed about nine and a half times as many people as ISIS has. So for the average Syrian, the regime is the threat more than, uh, than ISIS. And the Turks tried to partner with us in 2015 to create a safe zone uh, in the Al Bab region south of their border. That didn't happen for a variety of reasons that are mainly our fault. And then the Russians came in, and they're now trying to do the same thing. So I think I would say, I'm not saying that the Turks are owed or deserve a strong role in Iraq. I'm saying that you ignore them as a regional power at your peril, because they don't just sit back and wait for us to act. If we don't act, they will. And this is what's happened in, um, in northern Syria in the last, let's say, three months, where back in May, the Turks were getting upset because we were backing a majority Kurdish group in the Syrian Democratic Forces. They expressed their concerns. We did nothing about it. In fact, we doubled down on our support for SDF. And they tolerated that until about a month after the coup. And then they invaded northern Syria. Um, so I think you know, we, the Turks are already there. They've got almost a brigade just northeast of Mosul. Uh, they have long-standing relationships with groups in, in Kurdistan as well as in the rest of northern Iraq. And, they are a player. Whether we want them to be or not, they're a player. So we need to take that into account. Which is not, I don't think, to disagree with your point of view. Just, you know. No, I, I very much agree. And I think this is the reason why we're asking the question. I think I would just two finger on a point that you are inherently making as well. Uh, our uh, tendency to frame the theater of Iraq and Syria as one theater, which I really do feel like we were doing a year ago, uh, seems to be coming undone. I believe in part by the opportunity for an operational victory in Mosul. Yeah. Uh, and I just want to re-encourage that we do still need to treat them as one theater. I don't think we can ask the question, what should uh, Turkey's role be in Iraq, and divorce that question from what is happening in Syria. Yeah. I would just, and again, to, to agree with that, I would just say that the, um, one of the problems in our strategy in Iraq and Syria is that Frankly, it's an imaginary border now between Iraq and Syria. It's one operational theater. And if you're Iran... Except in one place you have a, a cooperative government. Right, well, this is the point I was going to make. In, for Iran and for Russia, right, um, they're supporting both incumbents against both insurgents. Um, for the terrorist groups, they're supporting all insurgents against both incumbents. We are the only player in this complex mix who is supporting the incumbent on one side of this imaginary line and the opposition on the other. And, and we've gotten ourselves into this incredibly uh, confusing set of circumstances that Jessica's pointing to. So is, so is there a place, as we think about Iran, where we agree with the Iranians, where we certainly need the Iranians to refrain from doing some things, we want the Iranians to, do, for, to refrain from doing some things, is there a role for some sort of US diplomacy with Iran, perhaps, to, to to have some discussions 
that could lead to other discussions about regional issues? I mean, do, do you think talking to the Iranians about Iraq is something we should be doing? Well, we, I mean, I think we're going to be, and I think we have been. Um, and I think the, that to the extent that I understand the Iranian nuclear deal, um, it makes sense to me only in the context of some kind of quid pro quo about stabilizing Iraq and Syria versus the nuclear program. The question is whether that quid pro quo was, as the Obama administration has portrayed it, uh, that we will, um, uh, we want to focus only on the nuclear deal and the benefit that you get comes if you comply on nukes versus the other way that it's been portrayed, which is basically we'll help you out on nukes, but you have to, uh, to help us on Syria. Um, so I think um, we're already talking to them. I think the key element here is guys like um, Hadar al-Amiri and the, the, the Bada organization and the Asab al-Haq and um, Qatar Hezbollah, the groups that are in the PMU that are directly sponsored by the Iranians and have been basically an instrument of Iranian policy within, uh, within Iraq, who are now formally going to be in, included in the Iraqi security forces as a result of the, the PMU Act. So we've got the opportunity there to engage, let's call it at arm's length with, with Iran, to find areas where we have common interests. Um, obviously, we don't have currently necessarily much common interest in Syria. I think we do have significant common interest in Iraq. Jess, would you advise the Trump administration to? Well, I mean, that's a real question. It's a wonderful question. Um, I do agree that there is interest alignment in Iraq, and I would particularly say that uh, it would be constructive uh, to speak with Iraq about how to preclude uh, escalating sectarian violence uh, in the wake of um, ISIS's uh, control. Um, I also agree, though, that one cannot silo our policies about nuclear issues in Syria and Iraq, and therefore engage in order to shape Iranian behavior vis-a-vis -vis our interests in the region, period. Um, and that Iraq can be part of how we engage. Yeah, I think so. Um, and, and to rely on you guys again, you know, one of the issues that, that we've not really talked about a lot, but which is a big issue, is, is the role of the Kurds who have traditionally been partners with the United States. We've supported them. Uh, I think there's a lot of sympathy in the United States for uh, Kurdish independence. There's a lot of fear of Kurdish independence in Iraq. So, if, Haley, if we could go to the Kurdistan question. Should, what, to what extent should the United States be supporting the Kurds as we look to some sort of settlement? Um, that's weird. So the first is uh, we should strongly support them because they're the most effective fighting force on the ground. B is we should give measured support for fear they would fight for independence after a settlement in Mosul. And third, we should only support them through the central government of Iraq because our policy objective is to support the territorial integrity of Iraq. And interestingly, right, the, the, the option of going through the Iraqi central government and putting an emphasis on the territorial integrity of Iraq is the least favored option. Mm. And the priority, as the priority had been, we have to really root out ISIS seriously from Nimrud province, but also we should support anybody who's going to be effective fighting ISIS. And if that's the Kurds, we should be supporting the Kurds unreservedly. It's interesting. Interesting outcome. Is that, is that one you're comfortable with? Well, I mean, my response would be, what do you mean by Kurds in that sentence, right? I mean, we, there, there's the KDP and the PUK that are rivals that have previously fought each other um, in just in the KRG within Iraq. And I think it was last August the, um, the, the, the government term expired, and there's a significant amount of internal tension within just the KRG. Then you've got the PKK, which is an internationally designated terrorist group, which has also been fighting Turkey for three decades and is allied with the PYD, which is the Syrian branch, which has these um, 
arm groups, YPG and YPJ, which we are advising. Um, and there was an incident back in May where US Special Operations Advisors wearing P uh, YPG, YPG and YPJ insignia were photographed by an uh, AFP journalist, which generated a massive firestorm in Turkey, uh, where people said, what are you doing? You're walking around with this PKK allied uh, group. Um, so you've got the sort of PKK cluster, and then you've got the two different groups within, um, uh, within KRG. And actually, there's also a significant pro-Turkish uh, Kurdish element. So it's, it's actually more complex than support the Kurds. And I was struck in the second presidential debate when Hillary Clinton was asked, what's your strategy for defeating ISIS? And one of the things she said was, arm the Kurds. And another she said, that she said was this point, which I think we're taking as an assumption, which is that the Kurds are our most effective force fighting ISIS. I think operationally you can actually question that. I think our most effective force right now is actually the Iraqi counterterrorism service. Um, uh, but the Kurds have the reputation of being very capable fighters, and that's deserved. Uh, but I think you know, th these things change in the course of a war. Uh, and I don't think we necessarily want to make ourselves so beholden to the Kurds that we then are forced to support a particular outcome after the fall of Mosul that may not be in the best interest of regional stability. That's just my two cents. I think on the Iraq side, and I agree, I was more concerned about this question of what would happen if we supported uh, the, the Kurdish forces in northern Iraq as the primary attack element to retake Mosul. I'm less concerned about the question now that that tactical coalition has formed in a balanced way than I used to be. Uh, I would pin two additional considerations, though, to keep the tension on the question. Um, one is the DIBs, uh, the suited internal boundaries across northern Iraq. Uh, when ISIS seized Mosul, they seized many other places. And the Iraqi security forces in Mosul dissolved on the spot. Uh, there were several other very significant retreats that also happened. One of the ones that struck me most was the wholesale retreat of Iraqi army forces from Kirkuk mm -hmm. and the base there. They literally handed over the keys to Kurdish forces. So there are other major equities in the question of where the line should be between uh, autonomous Kurdish uh, northern Iraq uh, and Iraq primary that are uh, going to be affected by how we and how much and or how on balance or how off balance we support uh, various Iraqi elements uh, shy of the question of autonomy. Uh, so I just want to highlight that as the victory against ISIS starts to feel more palpable, which I also want to pin with some serious reservations, this is a force that has come back from a much more degraded state in less than five years than it is currently experiencing. So we should expect that ISIS, even uh, competing among other uh, Sunni insurgent uh, champions, um, is going to continue to be vital. Even as it looks hopeful, uh, there are going to be a smattering of other kinds of disputes that could be very volatile for Iraq, uh, shy of the question of autonomy. We need to be very balanced in how we support numerous ground actors to make sure that we do not set the balance in a negative direction. Uh, again, I feel like commenting on Syria as the second point. Uh, it appears to be a net positive in Iraq, the way and the amount of support that we've provided to all the actors um, on the ground. Uh, it is not a net positive in Syria. Uh, we are experiencing lots of challenges, particularly as the operation for Raqqa uh, is before us. Uh, lots of criticism with how we have supported Kurdish forces in northern Syria. Um, and we are losing traction with potential uh, Sunni Arab ground partners whom we may want to be the eventual hold force in Raqqa on the basis of that relationship. So in Iraq, I feel like we're doing well. In Syria, I feel like we're doing very poorly. And again, where Turkey is concerned, if we're doing poorly on one of those fronts vis-a-vis -vis Kurds, then they have a legitimate uh, reason and the to, one that to happens challenge to be a lot us. closer to them. Yeah. Right. right. So uh, we do need to treat our uh, actions in Iraq uh, as having implications for our relationship with Turkey also. But, but, I mean, there's a resource question. And it seems to me that the, one of the conclusions that the U.S. government had reached in the past is that fighting these wars are a money pit. And you can never put enough resources, and the more you commit, the more people look to you to commit more. Um, in your judgment, is 
the, the order of magnitude of the resources we're putting toward Iraq, right? What would the order of magnitude be in Syria? How do you avoid being on the slippery slope when you're back into open-ended combat fighting a long war with no termination? Well, I think the easiest way to get into a slippery slope is to put in just a little bit and then a little bit more and a little bit more. Yeah. Put That's in the slippery to, slope. Enough to lose big, but not enough to win. Right. Yeah. Uh, no, I, I, I am very sensitive to uh, the uh, question of will to put in um, a larger investment into Iraq or Syria than what we already have. Um, I frankly think we are going to need to, on the one hand, to sustain gains in Iraq, on the second hand, to change conditions in Syria uh, that are not to our benefit. Um, but I do not think that means that you have to do a full surge. I think there are lots of strategic options that are shy of that that can create more freedom of action for the United States. It's also, we, look at, we tend to look at this stuff in terms of absolute troop numbers. It's actually much more about the specific components and the enablers and you know, the way that we, we structure it. I would just say from a theoretical standpoint, as from a counterinsurgency standpoint, there are two models that we know work. One is where you put in a substantial number of troops you assume the combat burden, you stabilize the environment, focusing on protecting the population, and then you transition to a local partner. The other model is you put in a very small number of troops, um, providing just enablers and uh, advice. You don't commit so much skin that you can't extract, and that actually gives you significant leverage with your partner. Um, what you don't want to do is choose the middle, where, as I said before, you put in enough troops to lose big, but not enough to win. And we've actually done that multiple times uh, with Iraq. Um, I, often when we talk about counterinsurgency, people say to me two things which I think are demonstrably false in the data. One is that governments don't win against insurgents. The data is very clear on that. Governments beat insurgents about eight out of 10 times, historically. It's, it, it's, it's pretty straightforward. The second um, thing that people often say is, there is no way that we could sustain, let's say 10,000 troops in Afghanistan or 10,000 troops in Iraq for the indefinite future. It would just break the bank and it's impossible. Um, and the one word rebuttal to that is Korea, right? We've had two to three times that many troops in Korea ever since the 1950s, guaranteeing the outcome of a fight that was over by 1953. Um, similarly, in Malaysia, my country, Australia, fought a pretty substantial counterinsurgency in the 1950s and then left a battalion plus and an airbase for another 30 years. And the insurgency, when I was a lieutenant in the late 80s, was still out there with 400 active fighters on the ground in northern Malaysia. They eventually surrendered as a result of the fall of the Berlin Wall and the end of world communism. But for a generation, we sustained a very long-term, very predictable, stable, but small footprint that gave everybody um, some kind of permanence and guarantee that we weren't going to move away. And that created the leverage that was needed. That's what we need to do here. So, so let's talk about what that would look like. Let's say the United States is sort of right-sized his presence in Iraq. We're doing the effective advise and assist. We've sort of managed to assemble this coalition, which seems more durable than some suspected. We're able to meet the audience's goal of, of stabilizing the Nineveh province to a large degree. What does the Islamic State group do then? What is their second or maybe at this point third act? Um, how are they likely to adapt to the new circumstances of a post-Mosul future for them? Do you know, okay. um, I'll go first. I mean, when I, think, when I think of ISIS, I think of three things, not one, right? There's a central state-like entity that's mainly in Iraq and Afghanistan, uh, Iraq and uh, Syria, more, which they more call- Afghanistan, which, yes. Yes, yeah, which they call the caliphate. Then there's a second layer, which is in about 20 countries, um, you know, growing in, in, in the Philippines and a couple other places in Southeast Asia, all across North Africa uh, and the Middle East and increasingly in Afghanistan. Um, and those are basically regional insurgencies that are trying to carve out sort of TEDx versions of the Islamic State, right, in, in their local environment. Um, and then the third layer is what I call the international, which is maybe 200,000 individuals and small ad hoc groups in Western countries and elsewhere that are acting in an autonomous, self-generated way but trying to serve the interests of the top two. 200,000, you said? Yeah, well, I'm judging that on the basis that Twitter suspended 220,000 accounts 
that are judged to be ISIS links last year. Obviously, 220,000 Twitter accounts is not 220,000 people. People have multiple accounts. But if you also look at money flows and, and actions, that, and we're talking globally here, right? Not, not, um, so, it, you know, th there's a... It's a multi-layer, I'm going to defer to Jessica on whether she thinks those numbers are right, but I mean, it's a multi-layer structure, right? So what we typically see when ISIS loses control of terrain at the top level is we see retaliation in the West from the elements of the international, and we see uh, expanded activity in the, in the Walayats, in the, in the regional groups. Um, the other thing that we're, and I think we're going to see that here, the other thing that we're going to see is a, a rapid effort to regenerate the organisation within Iraq and Syria. So Diyala province, Ambar province, the area around Deir Azur in Syria, parts of Italy, there's parts around the two countries where they will immediately seek to regenerate. And they've got an impressive, as Jessica said, a really impressive capability to regenerate. If you remember, during the surge in 2007, 2008, we reduced their combat numbers by 95%. Within three years, they were back. You know, so in Iraq. In Iraq, yeah, Al Qaeda in Iraq. So, you know, the, the, I wouldn't assume, you know, you take your foot off the neck of this enemy for one second, they bounce back. I very much agree, and that's really my, my core observation too. I see too much opportunity to continue the campaign within Iraq and Syria to suggest that ISIS is going to transfer its strategy to a new one in the wake of Mosul. Um, I do think that ISIS um, is, has been, and will continue to. Uh, grow additional capabilities. And I do think that it has tipped off um, a, a, a regional uh, campaign, uh, including in Southeast Asia, that is much more extensive than what we have seen um, a group competing with Al Qaeda do. Uh, but this is one other observation I really want to make. When it comes to the net effects of ISIS, um, I measure uh, one of those effects as having been uh, incredible gains to the Al Qaeda network at the same time. Uh, some of those have to do with messaging. Uh, Jesh Fat al Sham and Jabhat al Nusra before it. One of their favorite slogans uh, when appealing to uh, Sunni Arabs in um, Syria was uh, Don't worry, we're not ISIS, we're just Al Qaeda. <laughs> right, that resonates with us as alarming, but it, it is not alarming, the term Al Qaeda, to many of the constituencies to which they're appealing now. That is a huge problem for U.S. national security and those of our allies, okay. those of all, many, many states beyond that. So oh, I just want to highlight that as we talk about the things that ISIS can do with those opportunities, one of the, the decision points that I think is still before the remaining leadership of both movements is what the permanent relationship between al-Qaeda and ISIS is going to be. Right. I think we would be wrong to and assume the, that they're going the to... throw the Taliban in that mix too. Yeah. Exactly, yeah. that all yeah. of these movements don't essentially enhance each other by being uh, at a visible level uh, distinct. And, and while it's unfair would, would to ask, would you be surprised if there's sort of a hybrid third, fourth movement that comes out of this? I mean, that, that sort yeah. of... We, we always think that the terrorist group that we're currently fighting is as bad as it can possibly get. Right? That's what we thought about Al-Qaeda until ISIS turned up. That's what we think about ISIS now. There's groups out there that are almost certainly likely to be worse than ISIS and more extreme. And as we said earlier before the panel, the techniques that ISIS has pioneered are now out there for anybody to pick up, irrespective of ideology. So I don't think we're going to see this whole thing go quietly into the night after the demise of Mosul. And, and, and then part of their strategic objective is to avoid Sunni reconciliation with Baghdad because that would dry up the, the support they would have. They want to maintain the antagonism. How, as a country with a, let's say, let's say there's, there's broad consensus, we have an enduring interest mm -hmm. in, in reconciliation in Iraq. How do you encourage that when the, the, the strategic objective there is to create the division and you have powerful forces in Iraq that believe that the Sunnis are mostly terrorists? Well, this is one fundamental difference between the Al-Qaeda approach and the ISIL approach. Al-Qaeda has tended to run what insurgency theorists would describe as a popular front strategy, where they try to get everybody aligned on one side and the infidel on the other, and they say, we'll solve these problems later. Like um, Jelani made a speech last year where he said, look, we're not here to say what structure the state should have after the tyrant is overthrown. The moment 
the, the, the job at the moment is to defeat Assad, and we can talk about that later, right? Meanwhile, behind the scenes, not on TV, they're doing a lot of stuff to further their vision, but publicly they pursue this popular front strategy. ISIS has had a different model coming out of its history with al-Qaeda in Iraq and um, Abu Musab al-Zarqawi of generating a sectarian civil war so violent that it makes an environment ungovernable and then inheriting the wreckage. And that's still their strategy. Um, and I think we'll see how those two play out. But I, my in intuition is that the al-Qaeda model has more legs um, in uh, some parts of the world and the ISIS model has more legs than others. And I think we may see a sort of demarcation based on that. Well, I think we may even see uh, something that uh, begins to emerge without the label of either. So one of al-Qaeda's favorite plays globally right now is to create a franchise that doesn't bear its name. Uh, Jabal al-Nusra was supposed to be covert. ISIS actually outed it when it declared uh, the Islamic State of Iraq um, and al-Sham uh, originally. Um, I would expect we're going to see um, a force under another name form that is uh, sponsored by al-Qaeda within Iraq and that we're going to wrestle with this question in the not too distant future of whether it's al-Qaeda or ISIS or neither and it will potentially be a little bit of both. Does the U.S. have any leverage with the Iraqi government as we try to prevent this from descending into a sectarian exclusion and we're trying to, you know, trying to get the, the, Bag the, the Baghdad government to, to bring more Sunnis in and give Sunnis more autonomy? I mean, do, do we have, well, do you have anything to play with there? Well, I, I would go back to um, what, uh, what Dave mentioned earlier on in terms of the, uh, the proven tools uh, for leverage. There are lots of requirements that the Iraqi state is going to have uh, that we are well positioned to support, and I think we should continue to do so with conditions, uh, conditions that specifically uh, provide for uh, the interests of all Iraqis recognizing that a population that is currently not represented well in Baghdad, uh, that whose cities are more destroyed on par than those that are a majority Shia or mixed across the country is the Sunni Arab population. But I think the other thing that I would add is that I would put particular emphasis on uh, the provincial governments that form. There is a break uh, between uh, Sunni representation in Baghdad and uh, most Sunni uh, Arab constituents in Iraq that will need to be mended, and I think that the provincial governments um, is a, a place to focus efforts. Yeah. I mean, but, but we've been trying to do this for 13 years. Mm -hmm. We've been trying to, to, to see a very different kind of governance in Iraq than we're seeing emerging in Iraq. Or is, is there a prospect of having more leverage in the wake of a successful Mosul operation, or are we, we going to continue I think, to... I think it all depends how we deal with the, the follow-on to Mosul. If we disengage and we say, right, that's it, you know, high five, we're going to go home for tea and medals, as they say in the Commonwealth, um, that, then, we, then we're back to a 2011 scenario where we, we surrender leverage that we spilled blood to gain, and then we have to go back and do it again. If we recognize that holding onto that grip of the environment is a fundamental strategic objective, then we would, as Jessica said, we'd focus on um, the, the leverage piece going forward. Now, Nouri al-Maliki, former prime minister, widely reputed to, to be aspiring to be the future prime minister, was also the person who helped push the US out of Iraq. What can we do to, to to try to ensure or promote the possibility of an Iraqi political environment that really does want us to play the role that, that both of you are advocating we play long term. We may not have a vote. Right. I mean, I think attention, particularly high level political attention, and maintaining some kind of skin in the game is really important. And focusing on the needs of the, the partner without becoming a hostage to that. You know, not, not being. Um, uh, sort of drag kicking and screaming into whatever agenda the, um, the Iraqis have. I'll point out that the reason that the trigger for us leaving in 2011 was the failure to agree on the details of a SOFA. We currently have more than 6,000 American troops fighting in Iraq without a SOFA, right? Um, the, the Iraqi government, which wanted us to leave in 2011, was perfectly happy to invite us back as early as 2012. Um, 
but we just ignored them. We moved on to the next thing. We talked ourselves into a very happy um, mindset where we said, well, we killed bin Laden, right? So that means that obviously the threat's diminishing and that means that obviously things are getting better in Iraq so we can move on. And we talked about how the, the tide of war was receding and so on. Those of us that track Iraq for a living were like, actually, you know, that's not what's happening. But we weren't paying attention for a long period of time. And, you know, Jessica's organisation at ISW was a key part of keeping people's focus on, hey, this isn't, this isn't working out the way that we said. And you can go back to 2012 and read things that were written by ISW, which were very predictive of what happened in, in 2014. But most people just didn't pay attention um, because they were thinking about other stuff. I would argue that that's a risk for us in Iraq going forward. Right now, the place that I'm most worried about is, and we haven't talked about it much, is actually Afghanistan. Afghanistan was barely mentioned in the presidential campaign. Afghanistan's about to hit a very significant uh, security crisis in the spring. And you've got a growing ISIS presence there, resurgent Taliban. The very same assets that we need to maintain our leverage in Iraq are the ones that are in short supply in Afghanistan. So we're going to be um, dealing with a really significant challenge in the spring of how to balance that. I'm not hearing anyone at the political level on either side of politics talk about that. Well, I very much agree with the, the mention of Afghanistan, and I, I think I would further say that we've applied it as a condition for our support before that Maliki stepped down from office. So where he particularly is concerned, just but overall as an example, uh, we can set conditions uh, that we think are... But if he comes back into office, he might be especially grumpy. <laughs> I think we should engage in that question. I don't think he should. Yeah, I mean, I, I think the current Prime Minister of Iraq um, has shown an incredible degree of understanding of the need to be inclusive and to bring Sunnis along. And he, the people that he chose as Defence Minister and as police chiefs have shown that he's, it's not just words, he's actually convinced of that requirement. And I think that's the leadership that we need. Um, but, you know, it's a sovereign country, right? So at some level, you, you then have to um, decide how far you're willing to go with those kinds of questions before you, um, you, you just accept the decisions that are made. And, of course, uh, Iraq, is, Iraq is a great example, but Syria is an even better example of the perils of leading from behind. Uh, if you try to lead from behind for too long, you end up following, and that's what we, we're following the Iranians, we're following the Russians, and we're following the Turks in Iraq and Syria because we weren't willing to do the minimum and to step up and maintain our own leverage. So let me just close with, with the question you, you touched on earlier, that, that there's a possibility of really profound humanitarian needs. Uh, if you have to clear out the western part of the city, you, uh, they're, pre they're preparing for the possibility of 500,000 uh, people pulling out. But the fact is we have a million people mm -hmm. uh, displaced from their homes. Does that? potentially huge humanitarian issue give the United States greater leverage? Is this something that, that we should be seeing as a strategic opportunity we have to handle properly? Or is this going to be something we're just going to have to react to in the midst of a presidential transition? I mean, is, is there an opportunity we need to be preparing for right now that we're not? Well, I, I think I'm in favor of framing it as an opportunity. Um, I think there is a, a grave requirement to anticipate that that population, uh, I mean, the, the, the IDP population uh, in Iraq is not small currently, uh, mm. uh, it is, is going to have uh, a, uh, an extraordinary effect of its own. I think we've almost become desensitized to humanitarian consistent conditions by the uh, truly staggering number of displaced persons in Syria uh, or from Syria. Uh, I think we do need to take great, you know, great consideration for the ability of uh, the traditional sanctuaries for refugees or displaced persons uh, to uh, cease to have any more capacity to sustain the current populations, let alone to come to greater numbers. So um, I, I do think there is an opportunity. I do think that um, we, we could frame it as leverage. Uh, my, my, uh, my uh, desire is to frame it as uh, as a as a normative. We really should look to those populations to make sure that that uh, there are sufficient solutions for them. I do not feel that we've done so uh, in the context of Syrian refugees or IDPs. Um, I hope we do better in Iraq. I hope it changes the norm. Uh, 
but I would also say in a very practical sense that those are prime recruiting grounds for Salafi jihadis, uh, particularly al-Qaeda, and that it is in our best interest to do so. Yeah, that's right. I mean, we, we, um, we have the Nineveh provincial government, the UN, a number of other agencies cooperating to try to deal with. So there's the intent, which is good, and there's the capability. The issue is capacity. If it turns out to be more people than we expect or quicker than we expect, um, it's, it's going to be significantly uh, challenging. And it's worth noting that it's still, what, five, nearly six months since the fall of, um, or the recapture uh, of uh, Fallujah. It's much longer in the case of Tikrit. People are still very slow moving back to those, those cities uh, and are still stuck in uh, displaced people's camps. So this could be a very long-term issue. It's not just a temporary, you know, a few months after sustaining the Battle of, of Mosul. This could go on for years. And that, you know, what the problem with refugee stuff generally is that people lose interest, right? When it's no longer on the front page of the news, um, the donations dry up and um, this, this happened to the Turks, for example. And as you point out, a, yeah. well, a terrific breeding ground yeah. for precisely the kinds of movements that we're trying to... Particularly when you've got an organization that specializes in provoking grievances and then exploiting them right. uh, on a sectarian basis, yeah. Um, I'm not surprised. We've come to the end of time. We haven't fixed all the problems. <laughs> but I think we understand the challenges much better than we did uh, a little more than an hour ago. Um, lunch is available both upstairs and downstairs, if you like. Um, please join me in thanking Dave and Jessica for really helping us. <laughs>